you see the rainbow here? Yeah. See a rainbow? It's over on the other side. Come on over here. You see it? Me, huh? <laughs> Come on, mm. Let me see where to start. Okay, there are a lot of homeless people here in in, in northeast or north west Vermont, and uh, we're spread all over the city. So we got together, some of us, to uh, try to uh, bring this to the attention of the mayor and the governor and and the public. And. Uh, this is only a portion of the homeless people in Burlington. I, I know of three times this many that stay in other places and won't have anything to do with uh, this public demonstration. Uh, it's a peaceful thing. Uh, we're not trying to hurt anybody, but we want to bring it to the attention of the, of the public and, and the officials that run this. Uh, How long have you been a homeless person? Since 1984. And why are you homeless? Uh, I'm disabled. I'm not able to work uh, on a full-time basis, and, and you can't get an apartment if you're making eighty dollars a week. In fact, you can't get an apartment if you're making two hundred a week in Burlington. And uh, you can stay in places like the Way Station or the North Street Shelter, but uh, it's limited and it's it's, it's difficult living anyway. Uh, now, I know for sure last night they were full because I tried to get a room in there. I wanted to take a shower and change my clothes. Can you describe what the conditions are in the shelters in Burlington? It's uh, just basically a place to get out of the weather for the night. And they're crowded. And they're crowded. They're overcrowded. Right. And, and I know... Uh, the way station holds 40 people, and I'm not sure how many North Street holds, but uh, oh, excuse me, sir. I know of three times that number that are sleeping in box cars or tents uh, and abandoned cars. And are these people local people, or do they come the from other places? The majority are local. Really? Yeah. And so what's being done about this to help you? Absolutely nothing. And why not? I don't know. That's why we're demonstrating. We, we want something done. We, if they, you know, find us a, a farm or something or a building that we could inhabit, uh, it would be a big help. You know? uh, we don't have the resources. Some of us are physically impaired, some are mentally or emotionally, and uh, some are just... Uh, Alcoholically, uh, you know, I mean, and there are a bunch of us though that would take a job if we could get one. But when you when you go for a job interview and I say, "Where do you live?" and well, I, I live in uh, Battery Park, you know. <laughs> uh, I don't think I'm going to hire you. <laughs> so, what kind of things do you hear people saying about you? Uh, the majority don't say anything. Uh, you get a few loud mouths that'll put you down. And uh, there are a few people that help, like the food shelf and the waste station. They'll help, but they can only do so much, and the rest you got to do on your own. And now, the weather happens to be fine today, but if it was raining, it wouldn't get rained on. If it's snowing, you're going to get snowed on. And if it's zero, you're going to get cold. No? Okay. Thanks, Gene. Thank you. I, don't, I didn't hear you. I'm Lauren Glenn. Lauren, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Portion of the homeless population. Right. Around. Really, they sleep in boxcars. And Everywhere. Over the bank and Battery Park and hallways, and abandoned cars. It's amazing. I mean, it's not amazing, but people don't know. Yeah, that's the problem. Yeah, people, people should know. 
and uh, not uh, you know some of them are mental cases you know uh, Waterbury closed down they, they give them a check and send them out send yeah, them out you'll be able to stick them out on the street right <laughs> what's going on out here in City Hall Park well we're here making a statement we're homeless people and we're saying that Burlington and the state of Vermont is in a, and in fact the whole nation is in a crisis situation with its homeless population. Uh, we're here making a statement, not only talking about some of our problems, but some of the solutions that we see as well as being one way of, of alleviating the problem. One of those things is a research found for homeless people where they can be part of something while they become uh, productive around their individual trips to work cooperatives and farm cooperatives. The point of fact is that in this nation, we've seen a lot of stuff go down the drain and it's still going down the drain. Uh, things like losing 157 farms every day in the United States. Last year, Vermont lost 10% of our farms. Uh, this year, we're losing an average of one farm every day. Uh, the homeless population in Burlington has more than tripled in the last year. And we believe that minimum wage is a major cause of that. Minimum wage, we believe, should be $5.32 if it kept up with the rate of inflation since 1937 when it became law. The reality of the situation is that you could work a full week at, at minimum wage, earn $138, and because the average house in Burlington, average apartment in Burlington is running about $400, this means you have to take $100 of of your paycheck just for shelter and leave $38 to pay for uh, taxes and anger counseling fees because you can't afford to feed your kids. The, the reality of the situation is that that 36 percent of this nation's homeless population is veterans. We've lost more veterans to suicide if you include single car accidents than, than we lost during the war itself in Vietnam. Uh, we're veterans, I'm a veteran. Uh, we're out to make a scrap of minimum wage being so low. But we're also, be, we're also willing to be more compassionate with the business community than they have been with us. We're saying that we want a $5.30 minimum wage by 1991, but with an instant cost of living adjustment on it now so that if the inflation rate goes up, the business community raises their prices in anticipation of us getting more money, at least we can still live. That's part of the things that we're talking about. The other thing that we're talking about is that we believe that Office of Economic Opportunity has been a total failure. It started uh, some 24 years ago under President Lyndon Johnson's Great Society program, the War on Poverty. Uh, in those days, homelessness, poverty, domestic abuse, the rising crime rate, the rising violence in our society, all of those things uh, were much smaller than they are today. Uh, you take homelessness, for instance. We went from a few hundred thousand homeless in, in 1964 to more than three million today, with another four to six on the verge of it, mainly because of minimum wage. We've seen our, our mental institutions uh, mainstreaming people onto the streets, uh, ill-prepared to survive on the streets. Uh, basically, they give them a pill and stick them out in the streets, and if they don't take their pills, they go wacko, and, and, uh, and you have all kinds of things going on. We're not really taking care of any of our problems, and we're trying to make our government open up and see that. We have real problems with our com country's priorities. When we look at the graph behind me on the, on the hill, which shows things like housing, health, education, and low-income housing all easily fitting on the graph, but the orange banner that goes across the lawn up there represents military spending. And we contend that the only reason why so much money is going into that is because you can't see where it's going. And you have to ask ourselves, how many lieutenant criminals and above is running around with $30 million uh, Swiss bank accounts? The other side of it is we're, we're a little tired of Reagan hood, taken from the needy and given to the greedy. There's a place there where we're Americans and we are family and we do take care of ourselves. And we're going to make minimum wage an issue in this next campaign. We're veterans and we're, de we're declaring war on that minimum wage. It's outrageously low. What kind of response have you gotten to this proposal about minimum wage? Well, from the government agencies and stuff, they're stonewalling us, of course. We met with the governor yesterday. We demonstrated in front of her house. She came out for 10 minutes, and she really is an expert at manipulating the media, unfortunately. She came out, and she made all her points about visiting with the, uh, you know, having the, the state workers come out and do a survey of our needs. Obviously, she thinks that the way to solve our needs is by each one of us uh, finding out what the needs are and then taking care of us. 
but that's taking care of this view here. That's not taking care of the bulk of the situation, not the root causes of the situation. And she spent about 10 minutes and said that Sunday was her day for, for her family. Well, she doesn't realize the irony of the situation because she had her family to see, but yet most of us are homeless and we don't have families. And she said she was taking her son someplace and she was leaving, and she definitely implied that, that she wished we would leave too. We stayed after she left and we made our statements and then we left. And we came back here and then last night we was on a radio show for an hour and uh, did quite a thing and, and gave a more positive image of what we're doing. Do you feel that this encampment has helped the visibility of your issue, of the homeless population? Well, I certainly hope so. The, the point of fact is that there's anywhere from 18 to 22 people, homeless people, staying here each night, but yet Burlington's emergency shelter, to the way station has been consistently all but one or two beds full. So that means that anywhere from 18 to 20 of us this winter, maybe not us because who gets in the shelter, it's first come, first serve, so who gets in the shelter first is the one that, that stays inside for the night. But what happens to those other 18 to 20 people? You know, what happens to the people that you don't see here, like up at Red Rock and up in Milton and up at North Beach and, and uh, all over the state, you know, Northeast Kingdom, up here's people's park, there's families up there that's living. There's people, homeless people all over the state. And yet, with the, the Homeless Assistance Act, which was passed by the legislature, uh, by Congress last year, was designed to alleviate some of these programs. But then when you look at the way the money comes down, this has historically been the problem right along. There's all kinds of money coming. There was a proposal for Chittenden County, for instance, alone for $400,000 for primary health and substance abuse programs, counseling. But yet for the entire state, for the first year's funding, there's only $95,000. And with the two-year funding that's coming down, there is no plans for any additional beds anywhere. And that's why the law was passed. And we think it's outrageous. The whole idea of government is to ignore the problem, hope people will go sell to someplace else for the winter, and that's what's happening all over the country. Everybody's following the same idea of ignoring the problem. It'll go someplace else. The problem is you have a constant shifting population of homeless people who go from one state to another and find no help anywhere. So when you say that the homeless population has tripled since last year, are those Burlington people? Yes. The, uh, the way station did a survey on the, on the kinds and numbers of people that have been um, living in the shelter. And they found out that 85 to 90 percent of the people that stay in the shelter come from Vermont. One of the other things that we're advocating, by the way, is that many, many rural areas in Vermont is ignoring the problem and they're coming to Burlington. At present, Burlington is, is covering that cost. But one of the things we're advocating is that the legislature pass a law that says if a homeless person comes from a city and town in Vermont to Burlington or some other emergency shelter, that city or town should be responsible for that person's upkeep. Because the cost per day, and this is another outrageous thing, the cost per day, we've heard figures, of $50 a day per person, per homeless person. That's $350 a week. Give me $350 a week, I won't be homeless anymore. That's the truth of that. The, most of it's because it's going into staff. Nah. What would you like to see happen immediately? Well, what we'd like to see um, happen immediately is, one, a day center in Burlington so people and I'm not forced to wander the streets all winter long looking for one place to be. The real truth of the matter is living in a homeless shelter like the way station is very difficult. You're living with 40 people in one room, men and women in one room. And there's all that that entails from hacking and coughing to uh, smelly feet, to getting up all night long to go to the bathroom. So you leave there ill-prepared to do a day's work the next morning when you have to leave at 8 o'clock in the morning. So you'd like a day shelter, what other things? We'd like to shade day shelter and we would like to see something done somewhere in the state about more beds. All right, we recognize the problem that Burlington sees in that we are attracting people because we do have the shelters. Unfortunately, the shelters are full and many people come here and are going to suffer this winter. One of the things that we would like to do before November is get that research farm so we can siphon off some of the people off the street and out into the country where they can mellow out and take a look at their lives. How are you going to put together this research farm? Well, we have, we have all been discussing it and, and uh, all the people here 
that are camping out here and a good and the rest of the homeless population. Uh, there are a few people that are inquisitive and, and, and don't quite know. They've got burned so many times with different programs that the government has proposed that they don't trust things. But we hope that what we're going to do is invite people to come and visit and see what we're doing and see if it's something for them. But the place will have no, no alcohol, no drugs, and we're going to be self-supporting. We're going to raise our own food and provide our own shelters right there. So where's the money for this going to come from? <laughs> I don't know, but I know we got a cause to get it, and we're going to do it. The people, the homeless people in Burlington want it. They want to get off the streets. The business community wants us off the street. They're constantly shooting us out of their, each, out of their businesses and buildings and, and forcing us to walk around the streets. And all they can do is look at us with negative looks and say, you're lazy bums. The point of fact is you can't live working in Burlington at the rate that they want to pay us. My husband and my two children, we were living up in Swanton. God, I had an apartment and then one minute we have it and one minute we don't. The landlord was going to raise the rent and with the income that we have, we just couldn't pull it. So furniture went in storage, some little pieces got knickknacks and stuff got sold. And we just packed up and moved into our van came down this way. We started out with um, campgrounds first, um, Grand Isle, and then, uh, then we came down this way and we went to Burlington Housing and filled out their blasted papers. And they told us that uh, one piece stayed there, take the other two back with you and mail them to Montpelier and wait for an answer. And I asked them what kind of an answer, and they said, well, they'd be put on the list. I said, what are you talking about, put on the list? I said, we're out. We are homeless. I said, I have children. I said, what are we supposed to do? Just fill out the form and leave it with us, and we'll put you on the list. I said, this is unreal. I said, so I handed them the paper. They laughed in my face when I asked them about putting us in something or someplace, because we knew that there's uh, at least 12 to 14 empty apartments in um, Oh, Lordy, what do they call it? Down on North Avenue, the housing Franklin project. Franklin Square? No, uh, yeah, Franklin Square housing down there. And she says, well, there's no priority. I said, it's an emergency situation. She said, Emergen emergency to us is either being flood out or burnt out. I said, homeless is nothing. They said, no, that doesn't mean anything. So I just handed them the paper and waited. And around a week later, I get a notice in the mail that says that we were put on number 63 waiting for um, housing for uh, a house of some sort and we we're put on for number 80 on the list for uh, the low-income um, section 8 part I said this is a bummer I said, this is unreal they won't they don't want to do anything we're homeless and that's it we're not a priority we're not I don't know what else you call it. This is the pits. I mean, we've had it. We've been in low spots before, but not to the point where we couldn't find housing. But with our income and the rising of rents, you just you can't pull it. There's no no way in Hades you can do it. So you you found other people in the same situation? Yes, we did. We uh, were down in uh, North Beach camping out down there, and there was around two or three individuals that were out they couldn't afford housing either we ran into a couple of families down there with uh, with kids one one family had a, a four-year-old daughter and a, I think a little boy is not quite a year but they were they were lucky they they were able to get some help of some sort and found a place the other couple they had um, a three-year-old boy and a one-and-a-half-year-old girl, and when we left the campgrounds, they were still there. And we don't know where they went. And then we were told later that there's uh, other people all over, not just in Burlington. There's in Milton, and they're all over the place, and it's families. It isn't single people. There's like 500. One person said that they found around 500 people that were homeless, and three-fourths of those 500 people were families with kids. And they were with young kids, not just kids 8 and 14 like I have, but kids that were 10 and underneath the age of 10. It makes it, it, makes it hard all over. Mr. Stoltz, you can 
Come if they had to lose, did you just fight? Was you, what was you Dolly doing Parton already? There. Come stand right here. Dolly Parton here. Dolly Parton. <laughs> so, are you working? No, no, I'm under uh, incapacitated claim with the welfare department. They both have a clown name on. Uh, bad back, blood pressure, uh, blood disease. Um, there ain't a fool in this world that's going to hire me. So uh, I've been on the welfare roll ever since 1979. Uh, we bought a truck to do odd jobs with uh, to relieve the pressure with the welfare department. And uh, landlord jacked our rent up on us. And I don't know if Mother told you all that or not, but uh, yeah. we just, just couldn't afford to pull the rent anymore. So the thing, I think one of the things that's most difficult for the people don't know is that homeless people are regular people. Definitely. That they're not indigent, crazy people. They are if they want to be. Like, never mind. <laughs> but uh, no, no, these these people are all, most of them are square shooters. Uh, Ed, Roger, uh, there, there's a few little small minor details here, but uh, the rest of them are all normal people. Normal people hurting like Hades because uh, just like the sign says, minimum wage is creating homelessness. Because the wages are not high enough for anybody to live on them. No way. You can't, you can't pull it. So what would you like to see happen as a result of this particular action? Do you have any hopes that something's going to change? No, we can hope. But that's all we can do. Mm -hmm. That's about the size of it. You can't, um, we're hoping that it'll wake, wake people up to the point that our, we are out here. There are homeless, and it isn't just individuals, it's families, it's people that care, just normal human beings. You never know when you're going to run into this. One minute you got an apartment or maybe a house or whatever, and the next minute you've got nothing but yourselves or each other. We're just normal people trying to survive. Makes it, it makes it hard. We're hoping that this will just wake people up and and let them know that we're out here. There's not just us, there's others around that are in the same part, but they're afraid to do any of this, what we're doing here, because of retaliation of losing something of what they have. Or they're just plain shy, they don't know what to do. And it, it makes it hard, it really does. We just hope this wakes more people up changes some laws, help change some laws. And it's not just for the single person because it, families need to stick together and not be pulled apart. And this can pull a, a family apart, but we're not gonna let it. Uh, one point in time, I went way to uh, White River Junction. Uh, they had a uh, hearing board waiting for me and uh, they threw me out of there. The guy said, you got no effing business being down here. Get out. I got a witness to that, a uh, friend of mine that lives out in one of the projects. Uh, he turned around and he, he went down there with me. He was a Mies. Uh, he says, they asked you there to go to the meeting, and he says, and then the guy meets you at the door, and he says, he kicks you out. He had no right to kick you out, I had to go down but he wouldn't let him go. I had to go down at my own expense, I and mean, at the time I had a great big Chrysler Newport. I had a gas tank as big as a living room. Uh, I went down at my own expense and uh, got thrown out. For no reason, uh, I, like I said, I didn't go down there with the intent to cause any trouble, right. and they just threw me out. That's our government and then he for got, you. Then he got a complaint because he didn't make it to the meeting. Well, you didn't make it to your meeting. There isn't anything we can do for you, Mr. Sears. We didn't hear your side. He said, I tried to tell you, I was kicked out by the guy downstairs. And so that doesn't count. <laughs> Bureaucracy. <laughs> Bureaucracy. So is that your truck up there? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, step in. Yeah. That's what Mother and I and the kids have been, well, between the orange tent there. Yeah. Um, right now it's loan, on loan to Ed. It, it's on loan to Ed right now because he, he didn't have a place to Stay. hang his hat and we figured he was... Okay, this is, a, this is a major leaflet we put out. It says, demonstration against and camp against homelessness and the low minimum wage. And the three things we're mostly concerned about have been a low minimum wage, which creates homelessness and poverty, lack of cooperative halfway houses, so people can come, all folks can come back into society. And the third item is 
a research farm run by homeless people and others themselves out in the country where people can have a home, gardens, little houses and things. The second issue is very important. Was the city of Burlington finance board went down to Montpelier and got no understanding from the Commissioner of Social Welfare, Gretchen Morris, and, and the O'Rourke people. Apparently Springfield, Vermont's having the same thing, that Waterbury has turned loose people that are mostly disturbed, mentally disturbed, and we don't like to use those words exactly, because they're probably less emotionally disturbed and mentally disturbed than the Pizza Galleys and the uh, Cunins and the Parmelos. I mean, uh, Pizza Galley can... Uh, Help break the labor union in the state of Vermont here with the aid of Governor Salmon some years ago, and uh, he can then donate $500,000 to the University of Vermont. But you know, uh, that's what we call healthy mental state. So, those three points low minimum wage, lack of cooperative halfway houses, that the people then come out of Waterbury, end up in the shelters, and we've lost two this summer. Two died this summer. You can't say directly from the shelters. But if you're having mental problems, and you don't have a bed to go home to with the same bed every night, and you may not even have a bed some nights. And uh, you have to be out all day, forced to be out all day long. You go back that night, you might get a bed. You certainly don't get the same bed. And then you're in one room with 40 out other people. That does strange things to mental people. So they go into their shell further. When I said this one that died two or three couple of weeks ago, she had a good chance of at least being diagnosed properly if she'd been in a stable existence. I had this from medical authorities. That nobody was there to see her every day, every day to see that she was down. And we all knew she was down. And she got a brain tumor. By the time they sent her up to the hospital, she died. That was just about two weeks ago. So those are the basic points that uh, were involved. We're here to have fun. We got This has got to be a, a civilized country eventually. It's not now. We got less than, probably less than 50% democracy in this country. And when a corporation, you know, like our laws, every state's got a law that says a corporation is a person. Well, you know, show me a corporation with two legs and two arms. They don't exist. But every time you and I go to court with a business that says INC, they've got all the money of that business behind them, opposed to us, and they're immortal besides, because the law says they're perpetual. And if you can show me an immortal person, they might be around, but... Uh, you know, that's what we're up against. It's big business, the few rich run the country, and we're not being civilized about it like Sweden, Denmark, Norway, Holland, West Germany, and France. Some way we can do this better, hopefully. You got any questions? Yeah. I'm interested um, in the homeless community. It seems as transient as it may be, it's fairly tight knit. Is that true? Okay, this is an interesting question. You say, yes, I found more friends and better people oh. interesting the real values in life than the homeless community. In my own case, I spent three tours overseas. That means in Korea, Africa once, and back in Korea. And these are real poor people at that time. That's before Korea had the boom. And the first time in this country, I found people that were so aware of other people, like third world people are, is the last year that I've been homeless for a year now. A year here and a year, uh, this year, is a year homeless and being in jail part time. I find the people much more civilized than anybody middle class or upper class or book learned. And uh, yeah, we are, we, we support each other, we're friends, we, you know, we have our problems and a lot of fracases, but uh, there's a real, it's just it. And you know, we're real edgy about people come around, we call them wear suits, suits are, you know, people, they're not civilized people. And the uh, word professional is a dirty word and, uh, and things like that. But there's a lot of real, you can sum it up, Master, your way. It's just, we are a family, like Ed says. We're a big family. Roger, what would you like to see come out of this encampment? I don't know. What comes out of it is going to have to come out of the group. We don't have any leaders. We have no spokesperson. Mm -hmm. We're having a meeting tonight. It's our first big public meeting. And uh, let's, let's leave it at that. If you, you come, you know, if you want to get some of the things out of the meeting, let's, let's leave it to open democracy. Good. I don't know. You got any more questions? Do you have anything else you want to add? What do we plug then? Well, let's just say we're in the same. This isn't. I know some of the homeless people don't agree on this, but because. But this is a tied into what we do overseas. Overseas, we kill hundreds of thousands and millions, hundreds of thousands, like in Central America now. Here, it's the same corporations killing tens of thousands, tens of thousands. <laughs> 
mostly in Boston and New York and the big cities, but uh, they're dying up here too, and they're dying younger than they should. I don't, I don't get emotional very often, but I happen to know Sylvia for seven or eight years, and she's the one that died two weeks ago. Thanks, Roger. Hey, do you want to? we do an interview with you? No, I don't no? want to do any. Okay. Thanks. I'll do an interview. Okay. Surely. Are you part of the encampment? Yes, indeed. Okay. This is an Irish flag. Looks like it. Yes, sir. It says hands off baby. Ask me questions, I'll tell you answers. Okay. What's your name? My name is uh, Robert Simpson. Okay. Robert J. Simpson. Yeah, this way. Okay, Robert. How long have you been homeless? Uh, for about seven years. Yeah, and why are you a homeless person? Because I'm an alcoholic. And I um, have had trouble. Right now I'm working. But um, I do my best. And... Uh, because I've, been, I've had a lot of drug problems. You know, that's the way it goes. With drugs and alcohol, that's, that's the way it ends up. You know? Where are you working now? Right now I'm working for North Country Landscapers, digging holes, you know, digging holes. And I used to dig um, beetles and stuff like that, but now I'm digging holes. Hmm. It's, it's a real funny thing. Why um, have you joined this encampment? Because I believe, in, in a sense, that um, just to try to help these people out. I really, like, politically, I have a lot of pl strange political beliefs. Like, uh, I believe, uh, I believe in the Contra movement, which is really strange. A lot of people don't believe in that. I'm, I'm leaning to the right wing, and um, there's a lot of people who, who can't help themselves that are homeless. But there's also, I have something to say, there's also, most of these people in this park can do something for themselves. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I'm digging holes, right? Any one of these motherfuckers could get a, could get some kind of shovel and, and shovel and do something, you know? I mean, I'm, I might be uh, 28 years old and doing my my worst, my best at times, but I'm doing my best, right? And I have a tent, and I live in my tent, and I've been living in my tent for years. I'm not going to get into my um, breakup with my wife or anything like that, but. Uh, I know there's so many jobs around this town, there's no reason for these people to be un unemployed. But do you think even if they got a job and made minimum wage, that they would be able to have, afford to have a home? Of course, of course. Then why don't you? Why don't I? I choose to live in the woods. I, li I like um, waking up in the morning and seeing the sun. You know, that's just the way I am. You know, a lot of people, I mean, homeless folks, I mean, I'm sure towards the end of the, uh, you know, towards the end of the fall, it's going to become um, very cold, and I'll have to do something else. But as it is right now, you know, you take it day by day, that sort of thing. They tell you that in AA, Alcoholics Anonymous. Day by day, you live day by day, and um, you work, and you make money. I got money, you know. So do you, then, do you agree with the argument about the minimum wage that Ed put forward? I don't agree on nothing. No, my policy is politically, I know where I stand. Policies, that's other people to deal with. I don't deal with policies, I don't deal with nothing. Okay. You know, I just live as I live, that's it. Okay. But I, I, all I have to say to you is there's, there is jobs there. And minimum wage right now, the thing is, you can make, what's, what's minimum wage now? What, three, uh, 365 or something like that? 365? 355? You sit there and you work 40 hours a week, right? You work 40 hours a week if you're lucky. At 355, the prices of living are so high that you might as well, be, you, might as well you know, a lot, of these, a lot of these people would just gave up. Because, Chris, how can you make a living on 355? Really, you can't. What, are you going to sell drugs? You're going to sell dope? You're going to sell yourself? You know, it's, it's, it gets to be a, a real um, borderline between sanity and insanity. And then they wonder, then they wonder why uh, they lock people up, up on the street. People, people are sitting there with maybe one bottle of wine left, maybe a pack of cigarettes. They're sitting there on the street and maybe that, that's their whole world right there in scope. 
That's their whole world. And I've been there, and I am there. But I'm doing better. I'm trying. See, that's see, it's a, it's a notion. If there was some kind of um, if there was some kind of uh, payback, you know what I mean? Like payback. Like most of these people are Vietnam veterans. Most of these people have been to wars. Uh, they've had real heavy-duty things going on in their minds, and and the government and the people are treating them like shit. They're treating them like shit. They're treating them like they're some kind of fucking bastards, some kind of fucking degenerate, you know, generalization. Generalize the whole public. Make them into some kind of fucking box, man. Make them into a box and then shit can them, right? And you got people up here at Lunig, you got people at the Daily Planet and everything else. They all got money, right? And a lot of these people try. A lot of these people have been hurt so badly through the process of, um, trying to get the money and working that maybe some of these people really could use to boost up that that pay you know so they can support their wives and their kids and everything that's what, uh, that's all I got to say really basically thanks this is Robert Simpson on the park <laughs> dig it <laughs> this ain't gonna be in the news is it not immediately I would like it to be in the news. We don't do the news. How long have you been homeless, Sam? Three years. Three years? Yeah. And why are you a homeless person? Why am I a homeless person? Well, I had a choice at home. It was either to stay home and be abused or find out what was outside. I didn't have any money or anything, so I came to the streets, went to the shelter. That's why I'm homeless. And what, what's it like? What's it like? Well, at first, well, until this came along, at first it was really scary for me because I didn't know anybody. So I got to know people and, well, I feel uh, lonely a lot, or at least I did till I came here, really. But it's like I felt lonely and I felt like I was fighting alone and nobody cared whether, you know, about me, you know. So it was real hard. Oh, do you find the homeless community to be tight-knit? At this point, yeah. I mean, we all come together and we're all fighting for it. It's not just for one, one person for themselves, but it's all for everybody, you know? And, uh, you know, we know it's going to be a hard fight, and a, and a few of us may get what we need. Like, I know my needs have been met, and as soon as I find a, a place, I will be... Uh, on Section 8, and, but I can't turn my back on these people because they're my family. More than, they've been here for me more than my own family has, so. Do you think this encampment will have some good results? Uh, you know, yeah, it has, I mean, we're getting, you know, attention and, uh, Maybe not from the people higher up, but from the people we're trying to get right now. You know, like welfare coming down and talking to us. You know, we can't expect to take a mile right now, ask for a mile to get it, but we're going inch by inch, and I think we're getting an inch here, maybe two, you know? And you were talking before about th that you have had several jobs. Yeah, I've had several jobs, but due to my emotional disorder, which is post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, which I have because of childhood traumas, I cannot hold them down. I emotionally break down. Uh, I either go into flashbacks of past and I'm caught right there, or I make a mistake and I learn that it was wrong to make a mistake. And so I hear my parents, you know, what they've always said to me in the past about making mistakes, and I fall apart. You said that you're, um, you have a Section 8 housing certificate? Yeah. How long did it take you to get that? Uh, it took me, well, I've been on the streets for three years, so here I am three years later and I've got it, but it, from the time I got SSI, I'd say about a year and a half. Really? Is but it didn't come from the housing authorities. It came from a street worker, you know, and she's helped me out a great deal in the past month. 
Do you have anything else you'd like to add about your experience here the past week? Oh, my experience here, yeah. I mean, I think these people are, are, are great. I've never seen a group of people that, I mean, I've been in the shelters for like three years and I've seen people just sitting there not knowing what to do, getting tired of fighting, and, and all of a sudden, more came in. Ed Moore, I mean, he's been absolutely wonderful. And he's like a father to me, but it's like, we got together because we knew if we went to any of the outside people, there wasn't much we could do. So we got together and decided that one voice wasn't going to work. We needed all of us. So we're all here and we're all fighting for, in a way, everybody's needs, not just one particular person's. And it's great because, you know, and everybody here is dedicated to this, dedicated to each other. And they're a fun-loving group, they really are. And we're people just like anybody else. And we're trying to get other people in the outside community and these businesses to see that. And that, you know, we can't just get up and get a job because, you know, like child abuse and divorce and all this stuff, it's an everyday occurrence and it's lost its meaning. But for the people it's happened to, it's been a tragedy, a disaster in their lives that brought them here. But right here they can see we're fighting and we're asking for help. If we're told to go halfway and we'll be met, some of us have gone halfway and we weren't met. So we're asking where these people are, you know? And some few, few of them have come out, so we are getting, gaining some ground, you know? And that's quite an accomplishment. Thank you. Yeah. I got, I got a few more comments. Go ahead. Okay. Sitting into the sun like this. You want to move? Is that all right? Yeah. That's sure. All right. You can move over here. Are we all right? Yep. Let me just get back out of the. Yeah. There you go. Stuff on my eyes. Okay. Like I said, I have a few more comments to make. First, people, first place, people don't realize how easy it is to get on the road to being homeless. Um, I'm going to tell you a story. It's a sad story, but it's a true story. Uh, many people don't even realize that all they need to do is get a bump on their head or something and, and start acting a little weird because of, of something that's happened to their brain, and their family will just uh, disregard them and uh, you know, push them out of sight. One such woman is, is a woman named Sylvia. She had a tumor in her brain. Um, and for many, for several years now, she's been walking the streets and, and walking around and uh, becoming more and more outrageous in her, in her actions. Things like uh, wetting her clothes and stuff like that. Uh, getting up and going to the bathroom, but because her brain couldn't function enough to to get her inside the bathroom, she wet her britches right there. All the time, this raising tumor in her in her brain was creating these problems. Yet, uh, she wandered around for, for many months and, and uh, got little or nothing from our mental institutions or, uh, or our things. And she was deathly afraid of Waterbury because she was afraid that Waterbury was gonna kill her. Unfortunately, she went to Waterbury and they discovered she had a tumor in her brain there they rushed to the, the medical center hospital and she died from a brain tumor. She died two weeks ago. Rest in peace, Sylvia. The road down can take many paths. Some of us turn to alcohol, some of us turn to drugs, some of us turn to, to mental problems uh, and rather than taking and looking at our, our situation. Many of us arrive down here on the bottom uh, through one trauma or another. I, I had the trauma of losing my family after 23 years. They all just up and left at one time. I discovered afterwards it was because I was a unable to find work and when I did find work I could only get minimum wage. Uh, this is up in the Northeast Kingdom. Uh, I became more and more outraged in my situation and frustrated my situation, became more and more picky with my family and more and more argumentative with my family. Uh, and finally, my wife, who was an independent person, uh, decided that she'd had enough and she and the kids all took off. Uh, she left with a four-month-old baby. In fact, I have a grandson that's older than my son. 
the way that happens is that you have an older boy who has a son, and then you have a son after him. And my son, my youngest son is four years old, and my oldest is 26 today. Uh, we're, make, we're really making an issue here because we think that the American population is being deceived by our government. They're always pretending that they're solving the problem, and they send a lot of money down to solve the problem, but it always ends up in staff positions and little goes to the problem itself. Uh, we're, we're tired of waiting for government programs to come by to help us. What we're asking for is a research farm where we can help ourselves, where we can be part of something, where we can be part of our own family if, if, you, if uh, there is such a thing as a homeless family. As you've seen today, you've seen uh, young people, you've seen veterans like myself, you've seen families here today that are all homeless and all getting that way uh, for minimum wage and, and, and lack of good paying jobs. Um, I guess that's all I have to say. And thank you.